Hi, welcome everybody. Sorry that we're a few minutes late. We've had some tech issues and um, we're hoping to get everything else resolved. Uh, welcome to our third Medify webinar. Um, our um, presentation tonight is on methadone in treatment in the age of fentanyl uh, with our presenters, Lori Wiggins-Grief, Malcolm Han and Sean LeBlanc. Uh, before introductions for the rest of the evening and some announcements, I'd like to take a minute uh, to acknowledge that the lands on which we are hosting this meeting include the traditional territories of many nations. These are the ancestral homelands of the Huron-Wendat, the Anishinaabeg, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, and the Etiwenderons, neutrals, and is home to the Dish with One Spoon Treaty. Medify recognizes that the many injustices experienced by the Indigenous peoples of what we now call Canada continue to affect their health and well-being. Medify respects that Indigenous people have rich cultural and traditional practices that have been known to improve health outcomes. I invite all of us to reflect on the territories we're calling in from as we commit ourselves to gaining knowledge, forging a new culturally safe relationship and contributing to reconciliation. With that, um, I'd like to introduce our speakers and our evening. Lori Regenstreif is a graduate of the University of Toronto Medical School. She's been working in inner city Hamilton since 2004. She co-founded the Shelter Health Network in 2005 and the Hamilton Clinic Opioid Treatment Clinic in 2010 and has had an active role in recruiting and training clinicians to provide opioid treatment in addiction and in primary care settings. Um, he was inspired by colleagues in Ottawa and Toronto to help develop the St. Joe's Hospital Ram Clinic and the inpatient addiction medicine service at St. Joe's Hospital and Hamilton Health Sciences. These were services that she envisioned and planned while working on her master's degree at the Dalalana School of Public Health in 2016, which is actually where we met. Mm -hmm. Mel Cahan uh, is well known, I think, to all of us um, involved with Medify. Mel has worked in the addiction field for many years. He is the medical director of the Medify program in Ontario. Um, he is the director of the substance use service and the RAM clinic at Women's College Hospital. Uh, Mel has written a number of peer-reviewed articles on addiction and has been a principal or co-principal investigator on various research studies, including several randomized trials and observational studies. We know his involvement in policy and advocacy has been extensive. He's helped write several guidelines on opioid agonist treatment and opioid prescribing for chronic pain, and has co-authored several handbooks and guidance documents. Sean LeBlanc uh, was born in Nova Scotia and raised on a series of armed forces bases. Sean left an abusive home at 14 and eventually attended university where his expected child and his partner died in her seventh month of pregnancy. Sean arrived in Ottawa in the year 2000 and survived an opioid addiction, homelessness and criminalization, going on to found the Drug Users Advocacy League, also called Bull, in 2010. Sean later was the co-principal investigator of the Crowd Study, participatory research in Ottawa, understanding drugs, the largest community cohort study in Canada. He currently consults on drug consumer issues and Sean is a dedicated advocate and consultant. He loves documentaries, marijuana, smoothies, baseball, punk rock, and his partner, Catherine. And we sincerely hope that um, the tech issues will be resolved and Sean can join us because we really look forward to his participation in this evening as we have um, appreciated and valued his input on these guidelines. So just a reminder that our um, presentation will be about an hour. We'll leave between 20 and 30 minutes for questions. I expect there to be many. Uh, quick mention that letters of attendance for the previous two webinars will be forthcoming from U of T very shortly, I am assured. Uh, don't forget to fill out your evaluations of this evening before you sign off. There will be a red dot at the top of your screen as we wind down. 
Uh, our April webinar is with Andrew Herring, um, who is a real change maker and advocate for um, care of people with addictions in the emergency department setting in California. And we look forward to that. And without further ado, Lori, Mel, and Sean. Okay, that's that's Sean's. Those are Sean's yeah, slides. Yeah, so go back. We need to go back to there the original one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, thank you, Lori, and uh, welcome. Uh, so we're going to talk about methadone treatment in the fentanyl era, uh, new consensus guidelines. Disclosure of financial support. This program was uh, supported financially and with in-kind support from, uh, from Medify, the provincial organization that is uh, uh, advocating for education in addiction and uh, is uh, helping to provide oversight and mentoring from the RAM clinics in the province. Uh, so, Lori, if you could just speak to your yeah, so, disclosures. Um, my financial disclosures um, include a relationship with um, the following organizations. I received stipends from Medify Advisory Committee, um, St. Joseph's Hospital RAM Clinic, St. Joseph's Hospital Addiction Medicine Service, and the Errol Youth Detention Center. I've also received Speakers Bureau Advisory Board and Honoraria <coughs> from for uh, discussing a product we won't be discussing today. Um, I also work fee-for-service in an opioid addiction treatment clinic and I uh, do sessional work for eConsult and for the Shelter Health Network. Back to you, Mel. Thank you, Lori. Uh, I uh, don't have any involvement with pharmaceutical companies. I'm, uh, my salary is from uh, Medify, which is supported by the province. And I'm also the director of the Substance Use Service at Women's College Hospital, and I do fee-for-service medicine as an addiction medicine clinician. Uh, so we will not discuss uh, Indivior products, uh, which is buprenorphine, uh, in this uh, talk, and we won't name them. Uh, and we will be discussing, however, off-label use of slow-release oral morphine, SR SROM. Uh, the trade name is Cadia. So why did we decide to write the guidelines? The guideline, the, the main writers are Lori and I, uh, as well as Jennifer and uh, two other uh, colleagues, Lisa Bromley from Ottawa and Anita Srivasta from uh, Toronto. Sarah Clark is Medify's knowledge broker and she's uh, assisted enormously as uh, editor and coordinator of the guideline. Um, and uh, I must say that I think that for many older uh, addiction doctors, this has been an extraordinarily disturbing era. When I started off in the 1980s, uh, you know, it was a small group of people who were using heroin. Then came the OxyContin epidemic. And I think we all found that methadone was pretty darn effective for OxyContin users. Uh, in our experience, uh, once you got to a dose of, you know, 80 or 90 or 100 mill milligrams of methadone per day, OxyContin users may use other drugs like cocaine, but uh, they rarely used OxyContin problematically. Uh, but this is not true uh, in among fentanyl users. We have uh, patients who have uh, were on methadone who continued to use uh, fentanyl, who dropped out of treatment, tried to go back on, continued to use fentanyl then, uh, and dropped out and sometimes died. And it was uh, sort of horrifying for us to have a, a medication that used to be so effective and now it, it doesn't seem to be. I'm sure it must be like infectious disease doctors who are confronted with a superbug that is resistant to everything and that, that is sweeping through the population. So it was a, we decided that uh, we needed to do something about it. The CPSO guidelines were clearly inadequate uh, for us and uh, and we we needed to collectively do something about it so uh, we uh, conducted focus literature searches on core questions such as how effective is methadone for fentanyl users and what is the optimal dose and we came up with a draft and uh, uh, then we had it reviewed by a, a number of experts uh, pharmacists and uh, addiction physicians uh, that were 
uh, and that actually gave, gave a very detailed review. Uh, and we had persons with lived experience who also reviewed it. Um, we uh, hope to follow this with uh, sections on buprenorphine and STROM and general aspects of care. But right now we actually have completed the draft guidelines um, and they will be posted. Uh, they're, they're complete and they will be posted any day now, perhaps even tomorrow, uh, where you can look at them yourselves. And we also have a, a very, very short survey on Qualtrics where you can give your uh, feedback on the guidelines and, and we would appreciate it. So we're posting the uh, sort of near final draft of the guidelines, uh, but it's not the final one yet because we need public input into it. So again, going back to the, uh, for many years, the CPSO methadone treatment and standards and guidelines were the gold standard. The compliance with the guidelines is very, very high, like over 90% in, in surveys. Uh, and uh, so I think all methadone doctors are, are very knowledgeable about the guidelines and, and their various rules. Uh, the guidelines were written at the height of the OxyContin epidemic. Uh, and a major focus of the guideline was the prevention of iatrogenic methadone overdose. And that was an issue because methadone is very potent. It's actually more potent than OxyContin. We were having patients that were, say, uh, addicted to codeine who were started on methadone. Uh, so and there was a heavy emphasis on that. So some of that explains some of the rules. You know, if, you miss, uh, if a patient misses three or more doses, they must be addressed in person. You can assess them over the phone <clears throat> before getting another script. If they miss a dose, like 30 milligrams, they must remain on 30 milligrams for three more days. Uh, no dose increases without seeing the face patient first. So if they miss an appointment, they have to remain on that dose until they actually, actually are seen in person. Uh, patients on benzodiazepines must be started on lower methadone doses and then should, in general, not receive carries. Uh, and patients on methadone should not receive additional opiates except for acute pain management. You need an ECG before increasing the dose beyond 120 milligrams. Now, the, the guidelines were divided into standards versus guidelines. The standards were, you know, uh, things that you can't really uh, go against, and the guidelines were more general. But I think that physicians interpreted pretty well everything as a, a standard because it was enforced by audits that were annual. Uh, and, you know, physicians, had, many physicians had, you know, were uh, re-audited and sometimes had their license taken away to prescribe methadone and so on. So, so it was a fairly, uh, I would say, um, heavy kind of system. So uh, our guidelines, just the underlying principles, uh, we are, our guideline recommendations about dose titration are, are very consistent with the CPSO guidelines. That's because the evidence shows that methadone can in fact be dangerous during the initial titration because it's got such a long half-life and there's bioaccumulation, especially in the first few weeks when the half-life is even longer than it is uh, after a, a couple of weeks. Uh, but beyond those um, dose titration guidelines, all other clinical decisions should be based on clinical judgment, not rules, like, it, like any other part of medicine. And uh, we are now saying that the whole, uh, you know, uh, balance between risk of methadone overdose versus risk of, uh, you know, overdose on the opiate that you're trying to treat uh, has completely shifted. So a patient who remains stuck at 30 milligrams because of a rigid rule that the college has is at very high risk for treatment dropout and fatal overdose. Uh, in contrast, the risk of iatrogenic methadone toxicity is really negligible if the clinician uh, exercises reasonable judgment in prescribing. We, I'm sure it has happened, but we haven't heard of a patient dying of a prescribed methadone dose in years. It does happen that people die from uh, take home carries that are sold. We're not tolerant to methadone, but we just haven't heard of a methadone, uh, iatrogenic methadone overdose. And fentanyl users are particularly resistant to methadone toxicity because they have such a high degree of uh, respiratory tolerance. So we are saying, for example, if the patient misses several consecutive doses, 
if you leave a script for them at the pharmacy that they can take it um, without uh, actually being seen by the physician necessarily, and they could see the physician later on in the next few days, that will not cause harm and will help the patient re-engage in treatment. So our basic principles are clinical judgment that must take primacy over the CPS guidelines. And the clin clinician's main objective is always to retain patients in treatment and achieve an optimal methadone dose as quickly as possible. So what do we know about the effectiveness of methadone treatment for fentanyl users? And I was actually quite surprised and happy when you get down to review the literature on this, because there has been a certain nihilism uh, about methadone and buprenorphine that it really isn't so effective against fentanyl uh, but the evidence suggests that it is uh, for example in uh, this was one study by sordo uh, why my screen is blocking what i'm trying to read here but uh, it just shows let's see if i can, uh, can is there a way to get rid of that screen so i can read what i'm okay well the Sordo study shows that methadone is dramatically protective against uh, overdose. Patients who are on methadone, I think it's saying have a, a mortality of about two per thousand patient years. And if they're off methadone, it rises to about 12. Now, this is a really important study. The next one, Pierce study was from BC, and it was actually a, a cohort, retrospective cohort study from 1998 or something till 2018. So a period of 20 years, they looked through all uh, patients who were on uh, methadone and buprenorphine in that time period. Uh, except chat, sure. Um, and so what it found was that the relative risk of death while off opiate agonist treatment was 2.1 from 1998 to 2010. And it rose to 3.4 after fentanyl was declared a public health emergency. In other words, relatively speaking, uh, methadone was even more protective against overdose in the fentanyl era than before. And the reason why is that the mortality rate for being on opiate agonist treatment was stable from 2010 to 2018. In other words, people were not dying any, at any greater rate while they were on methadone even though fentanyl was there. They were dying at a great, greater rate when they got off methadone. So this is suggestive that methadone and buprenorphine, and the same with buprenorphine, I didn't get into it, gives really substantial protection from fentanyl overdose, even in the fentanyl era. Uh, and in fact, uh, studies like there was one really good study from uh, Rhode Island, which showed that people who use Fentanyl, regular daily users, uh, daily users of fentanyl uh, who were on methadone actually uh, didn't die. They had a very low, no death rate, no death rate in that cohort, although four people died shortly after dropping out of treatment. There's also another study, again from BC, which showed that higher doses are probably more protective than lower doses. So, in uh, of um, there was only 38 out of about 3,000 fatal overdoses occurring among patients who were on methadone in a 20-year period. Uh, over half of those were on a dose of less than 60 milligrams, and only 30% were on a dose of 80 milligrams or more. So higher doses of methadone appear to protect against overdose more than lower doses. Um, probably because not just that methadone reduces fentanyl use and the uh, frequency and amount of fentanyl, but also because it confers respiratory tolerance. So what that means is that when people talk about harm reduction, methadone and buprenorphine are by far the greatest uh, and most important public health strategies, uh, harm reduction strategies for preventing overdose. And we need to always keep that in mind. So the other interventions, take home naloxone, provide consumption sites are important, but nothing is as important and uh, protective as opiate agonist treatment. So now I'm going to turn it over to Lori. Great. Thanks, Mel. Um, I think my speaker's OK. Um, so I'm just going to summarize some of the, the the essence of some of the changes and the rationale behind it that um, we've uh, um, included and integrated into the new guidelines. Um, 
take home message is that for people who use street fentanyl, their opioid tolerance, as Mal was mentioning, and their respiratory cross tolerance is very high compared to what we were seeing 20 years ago when people were mostly dependent on prescription opioids. And one point of fentanyl, if you were to take hospital grade fentanyl, 100 milligrams of hospital grade fentanyl um, is roughly equivalent to about 20,000 oral morphine equivalent uh, oral morphine equivalents a day or per dose uh, and people are using a point or 100 milligrams of fentanyl now that's by weight so we can assume that there's it's impure and that the potency and the strength of their doses are a bit less but we're still talking about orders of magnitude higher than what we've seen in the past um, and we also know that the that access to and quality of their supply is uneven and contamination is common. So the toxicity risk is high. So we know that the less often people are using fentanyl, um, uh, their, their supply of fentanyl, the, the, the lower their risk of, of overdose and the more harm reduction we're actually participating in. We also know that with methadone, it can be protective over 60 milligrams, uh, doses over 60 milligrams and particularly over 80 milligrams. And we know that the other thing about methadone is because it's long acting and it's taken once a day, it maintains opioid tolerance from dose to dose of the short acting opioids that people are, are using. So, Really, the method on the molecule hasn't changed, even though the substance that people were treating, um, that people are using has changed. But, um, so some of the, the fundamentals are still the same. It still holds that a starting dose has to be 30 milligrams for outpatients, and that a dose increase should be 10 to 15 milligrams every three days. But we know that with the opioid tolerance so much higher, and with people repeatedly having to restart and needing, they need more than what we've been offering them. So we're recommending that um, when people are starting methadone, that the dose be tried, titrated by a maximum of 15 milligrams every three days, even if there's the presence of benzodiazepines in their urine, unless the patient's presenting sedated or nodding off or intoxicated to either the doctor's office or the pharmacy. And um, if the patient reports using street Xanax or binging on uh, uh, benzodiazepines or or uh, has had recent blackouts with their fentanyl use, you could titrate at a slower dose of 5 to 10 milligrams every three days or hold a dose um, increase whenever your clinical judgment prevails. But essentially we really want people to get up to a therapeutic dose faster than what we've we've been allowing in the past. The other thing is restart. So people, we all have patients, those of us who prescribe methadone um, have patients who are constantly restarting. They keep taking that 30 milligrams. They take it for a day or two. Uh, they, it has no effect at all. They'll often say they don't even feel it. And those patients that we know that are constantly restarting, we should consider extending them or leaving an, an extended prescription um, at the pharmacy for them where they can get it filled without having to make to go to the trouble of coming in to see the physician again. We're also su suggesting that you could even consider scheduling a dose increase. You could put on the prescription that if no doses are missed in three days, the dose could go from 30 to 45 milligrams. This is a big change from the past where, for example, if you have a once a week uh, clinic, you would have to have the, the patient see another physician in the interim. And the most sort of the newer part of the shiny new part of what we're um, suggesting is also using slow release oral morphine which is known as Cadian that's a trade name alongside those 30 milligram restarts of the methadone. So people are only um, remotely familiar with slow release oral morphine. I've noticed some people have actually never heard of it and that's possible because it hasn't been widely used um, outside of um, you know pain care settings. It's a full muagonist because it's just morphine basically that's um, that's um, packaged into a capsule with different with um, beads, and those beads dissolve at varying pHs. So some of those beads will dissolve in the upper gastrointestinal tract, and some will dissolve in the lower gastrointestinal tract and it's intended to last between 18 and 24 hours in, in the system. So we're suggesting that uh, 
we can consider adding uh, SROM when starting or restarting methadone. So for example, you can start somebody at 30 milligrams of methadone and add 200 milligrams of SROM oral. Um, and you can even titrate up the SROM for cravings and treatment retention um, in, in sync with the um, methadone titration and, or in alternation with it. Um, and SROM doesn't need to be tapered down. If people are doing well on it, there's no, no reason why you would have to um, necessarily lower it. The most important part is probably that when people are unstable and they're still using fentanyl, um, their, their SROM um, prescription should be written as witness dose daily with their methadone. The capsules need to be opened and given as sprinkled into a cup and swallowed with the methadone. Um, the, the main reason we suggest this is because uh, the risk um, risks associated with injecting cadian are quite, uh, quite severe. Um, cadian uh, capsules only dissolve in cold water, so it requires a cold water solution to dissolve them and uh, that means that it's not a sterile solution that people are injecting. Oops, sorry, just skipped two. So another new um, aspect of the guidelines that we're um, introducing is that patients who miss three doses and present on day four can continue on their current dose. This is a big relief for a lot of people. I know I've heard from a lot of um, patients with experience of their own and people with lived experience who I've spoken to and their peers that this is a, makes a huge change for them because three days is often what people have in their heads uh, that they have to drop out. Often they'll think they have to drop out of the program because they just have to start all over again. So for patients who, and then for patients who miss four doses and present on day five, we're suggesting that the dose be reduced by 50% or to lower to 30 milligrams, whichever of the two is higher. We're suggesting as well that um, we can that you consider increasing the dose if a patient has had most of their doses in the previous five days. So if a patient presents and says, I've missed yesterday's dose, I'm here for a dose increase, but they had two or three, day, three days previous that their dose could be increased either on the day they present, actually the day after they present. So you could give them a dose of 30 milligrams on the day you see them and schedule a dose increase for the next day rather than making them go another three days um, to have another dose increase. For those of you familiar with prescribing methadone, this is a, a classic scenario we get into that's quite frustrating for providers and quite frustrating for patients as well. Um, and it allows us to really move more quickly to get people up to therapeutic doses. And then just getting back to the presence of benzos, typically going back to the old guidelines, if somebody has benzos in the urine, they've missed doses, again, you're only going to increase their dose by perhaps 10 milligrams or even five milligrams. And in this case, unless you have significant clinical concerns about their presentation, we recommend you um, carry on and continue uh, increasing their dose by 15 milligrams every three days. Now the other thing is missed appointments. So this has often been a bone of contention with um, methadone prescribers is that uh, traditionally patients can um, have a prescription not be extended or, um, or renewed if they don't show up for an appointment. And this can, again is very frustrating for patients and creates a barrier for them to be able to reaccess um, care when things aren't going well for them in their lives. So we're recommending providing an extended prescription that might be at the pharmacy for uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, some of us have even go as long as a month with a 30 milligram prescription for people who have a really hard time um, and, until the patient can be seen. And we're suggesting as well to consider a dose, a dose increase without a visit for the 30 to 45 or the 45 to 60 milligram uh, dose increase ranges during that period of titration. Um, we do think people should be seen uh, once uh, out of the first two um, dose increases so that they shouldn't be have two dose increases occur without a visit in between. Um, and then once people reach 80 milligrams, we don't recommend continuing to increase doses with missed appointments. At that point, people have some degree of protection from overdose and they're likely to be continuing on. They've now 
been somewhat more engaged uh, in the benefits of, of methadone and in their care. We encourage people to communicate with pharmacists to bridge care. So for example, if a patient misses an appointment and then shows up at the pharmacy and the pharmacist calls you, that's an excellent opportunity to be able to get some feedback from the pharmacist, provide a continuing uh, prescription until you can see the patient. And the most important thing is never to stop a methadone prescription for a missed appointment. If a, po if a patient is dosing regularly and they're showing up at the pharmacy and the pharmacist has no concerns about their presentation, we just suggest that you can send a message to the pharmacist on the prescription um, and ask them to give you feedback and to encourage the patient to come in. Again, as I said, we're encouraging working with pharmacists. Many of us do quite a bit already, but even more so talking with pharmacists over the phone um, and getting follow-up and making sure pharmacists can reach you. Um, you know, it may not have to be 24 hours a day, but at least make sure that errors or um, faxes that don't go through by the end of the day, that there's some sort of um, opportunity for pharmacists to um, resolve any um, uh, unprocessed pro, uh, prescriptions um, and you can always ask them to hold a dose it's partly their job as well if they if somebody presents and they're heavily sedated or intoxicated the pharmacists are supposed to hold a dose and, and direct the patient back to their physician take-home doses are a big question and still quite a contentious topic um, we just suggest con considering them with caution. Of course, COVID carry schedules can still apply. We, some of us are familiar with that. Um, but take home doses of, uh, of SROM should be avoided for the reasons I described earlier in terms of the dangers of diverted and injected um, Cadian. Um, but again, clinical discretion prevails. For example, I have a patient who has a blown knee amputation and um, would have to go out um, on Sundays at a particular two-hour window in order to get that dose of Cadian. So on Sundays, he has a take-home dose. Those are the sorts of clinical discretion that we expect people to be able to sort out um, for themselves over time as you get more comfortable prescribing uh, SROM and again um, with the new scheduling of um, methadone prescribing. For people who've actually stopped using fentanyl and wish for caries and are stabilizing in other aspects of, your li of their life, we suggest giving uh, them at least a month of stability. So after the first month of stability, you can consider take-home dosing. Um, but at that point, applying a contingen contingency management um, approach uh, with urine drug screens. And then for really stabilized patients who are now fentanyl negative in their urines and are socially stable and are trying to get back to work, or return to school um, and they need regular take-home doses for work or travel, we suggest that um, they be considered uh, for a transition over to buprenorphine, which is, has a little bit more flexibility and safety. Urine drug screening, another um, issue that we're, we're considering um, should have more flexibility as well. Again, think carefully about whether the urine drug screening you're doing is going to direct your decision making. It should do so when you're starting somebody. Obviously, you want to make sure that they have opiates in their urine. When you're titrating in those first weeks, you do want to be monitoring what might be showing up in their urines. However, point of care testing can miss a lot of sedating medications. So somebody could be using no benzodiazepines at all, they might be using a barbiturate. They might be using something that on point of care testing, you're gonna miss completely. So we have to be careful not to invest too much confidence in the point of care urine tests. Um, and I've been finding as I, I, I don't know whoever was um, on the call yesterday that I find that I like to give patients the opportunity to have their urine sent out to find out what they're getting in their supply and more for their benefit than aren't my own. If someone comes in and says they're using fentanyl and it's showing up in their urine, I really don't need to be testing their urine again in the following week unless they, they divulge to me that they really want to know what else they're getting in their fentanyl supply, in which case I'm happy to send it out. It's covered under OHIP and it gives us both information. Um, when patients are requesting a dose change or there's a history of a sedated presentation, you might be considering using drug testing at those times. If they've stopped their fentanyl use and achieved social stability, as I mentioned before, urine drug screening can be used um, for contingency management to earn take-home doses. 
I find some patients really like to have the urine drug screen test done. The ones that choose to have it done, those are the ones I'm most likely to be urine drug testing and others who are using fentanyl in an ongoing way, I don't push urine drug testing. I make it optional for them. Um, so when they're requesting it, maybe they want to take a printout for their wife at home or they need it for um, to show their boss. Uh, they shouldn't, but they might. That's fine. Um, and again, as I said, a lot, so many sedating medications aren't picked up by point of care testing. There's a variety of benzodiazepines now that you can order online, many of which um, manage to evade a point of care test. So I really don't think we want to be um, falsely reassured by what we see in point of care tests. The other thing is we're suggesting and we're really encouraging this as a sort of an overarching ethos of, of this document is that patients will, they may still be using fentanyl and they may be be resistant to accepting uh, dose increases of fentanyl, of sorry, of methadone, because as the dose gets higher, it blocks some of the euphoric effects of um, fentanyl. However, when they've been on a dose for a week or two and it's a low dose, like 40 milligrams or 45 milligrams, we recommend encouraging them to take small dose increases. So I'll suggest somebody take a five milligram increase every week or two just to try to nudge them up. And I suggest a lot of transparency with patients. Share some of the information that, that Mel just talked about. I'll tell people, if we can get you to 60 or somewhere between 60 and 80, we know that it's going to be more protective for you. If you miss a dose here and there and that's helpful to you and your drug use, that's fine. But ultimately, we know that if you stay on these higher doses, it's more protective. And so I really do try to share some of the data, some of the newer data that we have. And again, um, for people who are very resistant to accepting dose increases, I've found and a number of us have found that providing SRAM um, really does actually help because again, we're increasing their opioid tolerance. We're increasing their opioid tolerance by giving them an oral um, substitute that hopefully is gonna reduce the number of injecting events that occur in their life every day um, and thereby reduce their risk. And for patients that are still using fentanyl at 100 milligrams, you can continue to increase that dose and or you can continue to add or and increase the SROM. We're suggesting between two and 300 milligrams. Some questions have come up about ECGs because we're finding that patients on uh, fentanyl um, tend to need higher doses of effective doses of methadone um, to get to therapeutic levels where their, their fentanyl use is is decreasing and stopping um, and uh, traditionally we the old guidelines had said don't go over I think it was 120 or 130 without a 12 lead ECG whenever possible well sorry the, the guidelines were kind of cut and dry get an ECG and you can't go any higher until then and many of us had patients who were stuck at that dose they didn't get around to getting the ECG and they didn't get any improvement in their the therapeutic benefits of the methadone. We're suggesting that the risk of a patient overdosing or dying from a fentanyl overdose is higher than the risk of somebody um, experiencing a, a, an event, a torsad event um, pro, from prolonged QT from a higher methadone dose. Uh, but we also suggest that if patients are starting to get higher in their dose, that you add SROM or for patients who are at risk of QT or have a history of prolonged QT, that you add SROM um, until you can obtain an ECG. And we really, again, another overarching theme of this document is we really want to promote treatment retention. So we want to adopt practices that promote treatment retention and reduce the barriers to treatment reentry for people who are drifting in and out. They may be pre-contemplative, but they are getting some benefit from the long acting effects of the oral opioid uh, methadone. And um, we'd like to in encourage and reduce the things that keep people from re-accessing their provider and re-accessing the pharmacy that's providing them with their opioid agonist. The frequency of visits that people have should be based on their clinical need and your decision making, not on a fixed schedule that says they have to come in every week or they have to sample twice a week. Um, and for example, somebody with stable, who's on stable doses can come in monthly, whether they're, um, if they're 
not they don't have take home doses and they are on a stable dose and they don't wish a dose increase so for example i have a number of patients on 100 milligrams they're still using fentanyl uh, but they're happy on the 100 milligrams and they're generally okay they don't have any take home doses they sample once a month and in fact some of them have sampled less than that during covid because we have telephone calls once a month instead i'm more reassured knowing that they're on that dose and that they're accessing that dose at the pharmacy every day. And this is really where the treatment is life-saving. Um, I think that the data really, really supports um, the importance of keeping people in treatment and simply reducing the number of times they inject itself is harm reduction. Um, and it, in a number of ways, we, we um, we're hoping that we can use methadone that's been traditionally provided in a very rigid and structured um, setting to be more of a, a, a broader uh, harm reduction to recovery pathway for people. So just to conclude, long-acting opioid agonist treatment is life-saving. It reduces the desire and frequency of fentanyl use and the events, especially injection events for people who are injecting fentanyl. Um, people who use fentanyl have very high opioid tolerance, but methadone still has um, cautions that we need to acknowledge and respect. We want everybody to encourage retention and treatment, provide prescription extensions whenever it just makes sense to do that, expedite dose increases whenever you can, educate your patients um, as much as you can with the information and knowledge that you have access to, and engage with their pharmacists. Encourage the treatment re-entry and facilitate their maintenance by ensuring that their prescriptions are always renewed when, even when visits are missed. So Mel mentioned, but I'm gonna acknowledge again, um, the Medify uh, staff, Sarah Clark and Kate Hardy, and actually adding to this uh, slide now, we have Lori Smith, our newest um, member, uh, our newest admin support. Uh, the co-authors are Lisa Bromley, Anita Srivastava, and Jennifer Wyman, as well as Mel as myself. And peer reviewers included Sean LeBlanc, who's going hopefully to be speaking to us next. He's from the Drug Users Advocacy League, and he's also, um, I believe, a founder of Canadian Association of People Who Use Drugs. So that's the end of my section. I'm going to introduce Sean, and I'm going to cross my fingers and hope we've gotten him on because we were having some difficulties before we all were engaged here. So Marta, are you there? <laughs> Jennifer? Hi, I'm Hi. here. So um, I am sad to say that Sean was not able to get on the line um, with due, due to technical glitches. So um, I'm, I'm sure we're all disappointed. It would really have been great to have his- That's why everybody's here. here. I know. <laughs> we all came for Sean. So That's why I'm here. <laughs> I know he's disappointed and tried really hard. I, I don't feel that I can do any justice okay. to any slides that he presented. Um, I will say that um, in my discussions with him, I know he took a really careful and thoughtful look and thought that there were many very positive um, suggestions and innovations here that he thought would be um, useful and welcomed. Um, and I hope that we will have an opportunity to um, to hear from him in some format going forward because I think it's really vital. Um, I want to say on that note that um, in terms of the writing group um, who developed these guidelines, um, that I think we can all acknowledge that we were a bunch of physicians and that what we really need to do going forward um, is make sure that um, as we receive feedback on these and go forward with developing other guidelines that we're really being inclusive from the very beginning um, and that includes um, our colleagues, people who have lived and living expertise in using drugs and our colleagues in pharmacy and nursing um, and, the, and the other allied professions. So 
Um, there is a message that Sean said he can try to answer some questions in the chat if people want to pose some specific questions to him there. Um, what I think I will do is go through some of the questions and points that have come up in the chat for, um, for Lori and Mel. Um, I can't believe actually that there haven't been more. So please feel free to keep sending them uh, because we have a little bit of extra time. Um, so one of the first questions um, that came up was when to stop Hadian? Um, when you're incorporating or you're, you're adding SROM to augment methadone, I think that's one of the challenges that people are really wondering about. How long do you do to chew the do you continue to combine the two? Uh, I, do you want me to, I could have a try at that. Thanks, Mel. I, I should first of all say that uh, there is very little uh, evidence on uh, what we're recommending in terms of combining uh, Cadian with methadone. Uh, the, the main evidence came from actually, ironically, from the Saskatchewan College of Physicians and Surgeons, where uh, they have been combining Cadian with methadone for a number of years. And uh, they report uh, really good outcomes, but they haven't actually published it. They mentioned it in their guidelines that they've used this on hundreds of uh, patients to relieve withdrawal symptoms in the early period. Their protocol was to go up to I believe it was 300 milligrams, I'm not sure, maybe 200 milligrams, and then taper down routinely. Um, our view is that it doesn't necessarily need to be tapered down. Uh, I think that you um, can make a clinical decision. Uh, if the patient seems to be getting mainly benefit from methadone, then continue titrating up methadone and uh, taper down on cadian. But if it appears that the cadian is you know, uh, adding significant benefit, then maintain it. I think that our, uh, again, our view is that uh, the combination of methadone and cadian, to the extent that it reduces fentanyl use and keeps people in treatment, uh, its benefits far outweigh any theoretical risks. Thanks, Lori, did you wanna to add to that? I have a next um, question. Yeah, just, just in terms of, from my experience, um, I would say that I, I most of there's there's actually two parts to this. One is most of the people that start on Cadian. It's like the Cadian because the Cadian always works the first day, so the Cadian will always kick in on the day that they to its full extent on the first day that they they're taking it. So if they're taking 200 milligrams of Cadian on day one and and methadone 30 on day one, the methadone's not really gonna kick in until the third day, but the cadian's gonna work for them right away. So that provides, first of all, an incentive, like it's it makes it worthwhile for them to go those first two days, whereas a lot of people just don't have the patience to soldier on for three straight days to the pharmacy um, when you know other things are in chaos for them. So there's that. There's also the fact that once they start titrating up, if you can continue the Cadian, they're not going to suddenly lose their tolerance. It's not like you're giving Cadian and methadone to somebody. We're talking about people who use fentanyl. So we're talking about people who are using, let's say, 10,000 oral equivalents. So they're using uh, 100 Cadian 100 milligram tablets. Did I do my math right? <laughs> A day. So they're they're using a lot more than what we're giving them, and yet they are comfortable with a couple of hundred. It does make a difference for them. Um, and so, I mean, I, I don't, and I don't take it away, although I do find of my most successful patients, once they get to about 120, they often don't feel they need the Cadian anymore. They're not really feeling it. It may or may not benefit them. Sometimes they do. I have a couple of patients who've stayed on the, the Cadian. Those are patients who are usually still using fentanyl, Patients who are trying to get away and get better are usually able to cease using the fentanyl and then eventually remove the, the Cadian. And they usually choose for themselves to do it. And I give them, I just make it an option for them. I just find it's less interesting when people's doses are more therapeutic. 
Um, I'm going to jump a little bit um, because one of the questions has to do with um, looking at the pharmacology. So I think this is kind of the pharmacokinetics and dynamic of methadone and strom. And either one of you, Mel or Lori, could you remind people about the differences in terms of those peaks? Um, there's the issue of the peak, um, and then there's the issue of the half-life and why we use them together and why we can dose them at the same time. Um, well, I, I, I could start off with that. Methadone is a really unusual drug in that uh, its half-life is uh, very high at the beginning of treatment, and then liver enzymes are uh, generated uh, to reduce, to increase the speed of metabolism, so then it slows down. So a patient who starts off with methadone, uh, 30 milligrams, the half-life can be uh, in the range of uh, uh, days and days, and it can build up in the serum very, you know, quickly. So a patient who starts on a certain dose, you know, if it's too high, like 40 milligrams, they can end up toxic and even overdose by day five because of bioaccumulation. But then the liver kicks in and, and it gets faster at, at regenerating it, so, or metabolizing it, so the half-life goes down. Uh, whereas uh, SRAM, uh, the half-life uh, is is the same. Uh, there is no none of this speeding up uh, over time. Uh, so patients, so you can increase the dose um, every day with SRAM. Uh, in terms of peaks and valleys, yes, there is a slight peak with methadone, and then it does decline over time. Uh, the peak is probably uh, about two hours after taking methadone, and then it does decline over time not to anywhere to zero, but it, uh, patients can start to feel withdrawal at, at a certain point later on in the day. And I imagine it's uh, s similar with the uh, Cadian, but I'm not that familiar with the pharmacokinetics. So the reason why we added it, as Lori said, he added them together, is that it's safe to add uh, the, the Cadian. Uh, you you can't have to go really slowly with methadone, can only go every three to five days because of its prolong prolonged half-life. But with Cadian, you could increase the dose every day and you don't need to worry about the dangers there. So that reduces cravings, reduces withdrawal, reduces fentanyl use, and keeps people in treatment. If I'm not mistaken, I seem to remember in one conversation uh, or something read that the Cadian uh, peaks around four hours and that patients really find this helpful because that first dose, those first days of methadone doses are really too low and the Cadian kind of gets them through those days and it, it peaks a little bit later. So, uh, you know, I, 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 can't, I have to say that the benefit is quite striking. When people have never been offered this before and you offer it to them, they have this <laughs> blank look like, what? Um, okay, morphine, okay. Uh, but it, it is really striking when they come back after a few days and they just say, definitely it helped. Because otherwise they would just say no what why bother but they yeah. definitely are clear that it helps so so lisa the fever typed in the, the chat cadian peaks closer to 10 hours and i oh, think okay. that we, we know that sort of from the literature and um and also from people's reports that they feel more level for longer and that's one of the reasons that we don't suggest that people split their methadone and SROM doses, but take them at the same time, because just by virtue of the way the SROM works and the absorption of those beads, they'll naturally get that peak a little bit later. And so it, it helps to level out overall. Um, one of the questions was, by what increments would you increase the SROM? So I'm gonna put that in two different scenarios. Let's say you have someone who is already on um, a dose of methadone that they don't want to go up on, but they'd like to go up on their SROM. So that's going to be scenario number one. Um, would you go up by 30, 50, 100? And what would your considerations be there? Lori, do you want to so I, I would, uh, again, you know, it, it's not um, an exact science, but it, it really depends on the patient. Patients I know well, and I remember we're still talking about people using fentanyl. We're not talking about all patients on methadone. We're talking about fentanyl using patients who I know are, are still clearly using lots of fentanyl. They're still very uncomfortable when they come in and so on. 
I will go up to 300 milligrams with Acadian while I'm titrating the methadone. That doesn't mean we're going to recommend this doing that. What we're thinking more is that you should be titrating. Start with the Acadian. Start with 200 milligrams with the 30 as long as there's no other concerns. Um, and once you start getting higher, if they don't want to go, go higher, you can go up. I go up. I see people once a week and they don't we don't, I don't raise it in between. So I might go up 100 if they're down under 60. So if their methadone dose is under 60, uh, I'll go from 200 to 300. Once I get over 60 to 80, I'll probably go up by 50. By then they're getting more comfortable. They're getting more grateful. I know, I'm sorry. You wanted a recipe. <laughs> Quarter cup of this. <laughs> it's, um, I, I think what you're speaking to is the fact that um, it, it takes time as a prescriber to get comfortable. Yes. And there's a big conversation happening with your patient about how they're feeling and how the meds are working for them and how much they're using. So to your point about the recipe, I, I will continue to go up by 100 milligram increments. Um, if people are still using in big ways, there's withdrawal, there's no sedation, and it, it seems that we're making some headway um, in and balancing. So. But I do just want to say that, um, you know, Mel, you mentioned going up every day on SROM. And I think that um, most of us probably wouldn't go up more than every two days based on looking at the BC guidelines, although there are no really clear guidelines. Um, and then this gets to another really important question, which is do you increase? both methadone and SROM on the same day? And what are your thoughts about um, sort of alternating? And I think that, Laura, you're making a really important point. Maybe you can factor into this answer. Sorry, I always throw in too many different scenarios, but many of us are seeing patients once a week. So if you're seeing someone now and they're on 60 of methadone and um, 300 of strong, and you know that week away is a long way, um, how would you balance that? Would you consider doing one increase now and a pre-planned one? Do you have any other suggestions for how to um, assess people or connect with people without that formal visit? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I have to say that in the back of my mind, I also have all these thoughts about, well, but that depends on the patient, that depends on the patient, because we all have patients who, when they come in, they're really, really, they just feel unstable. They will tell you how unstable they're feeling, and they're using, let's say, more than five points a day. So that's another thing, is how much are they using? And this takes time to get to know people and to get to understand the impact of their doses but the higher doses people will, get, will come in now and say they're using 10 points a day in fact I'm a bit concerned because in the last two weeks I've heard from a couple of patients that the fentanyl has weakened which concerns me because that means it could get more potent again and they're weighing out the same amount or somebody's weighing out that same amount and using that same amount so that's concerning because that means a point just got weaker which means to people might be doubling up the number of points they're using and that could then be a problem down the road. So, but I do think in my mind, if somebody says they're using five to 10 points a day, which is to me really high, I'm more likely to go up by 100 milligrams of Cadian at the same time I'm going up on the methadone, which I wouldn't normally do. I usually try to get the methadone up with 200 or 300 of Cadian. We all, depends on how we get comfortable with these medications as well and we have to be respectful of our own comfort level first so if you're prescribing cadian for the first time and you're just not a hundred percent sure of yourself and you only prescribe a hundred instead of 200 that's okay the patient will let you know you cannot you can tell them you know what i'm going to give you a hundred i'll check back with you in x number of days let me know if you feel any benefit from it be really transparent about your own experience with this as well. I, I'm telling patients, you know, I, this is the first time I've ever done this before, or I've never done it quite like this before, so give me some feedback. Um, and if Sean was here, well, he, we could, he could answer a question, but I'm not really sure what I would ask, because I don't know if he's ever... Sean, have you ever had um, slow-release oral morphine? Are you there? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Can you tell us... Um, 
if you could like really and you have experience with fentanyl use are you there I'm sure it'll take him a minute to um, to type in. So yeah, no. The, okay, so so can you? What's the highest dose of SRAM that you had together with fentanyl? While Sean types, I'm just right. going to mention Lisa's point about um, obviously really important still to make sure that we're talking about naloxone. And um, I, I just feel completely incapable of gauging, you know, what the potency of a point is um, with respect to what you're talking about, Lori. So it's not that we don't ask or want to know, because I think it's still kind of useful to gauge, but... Um, so Sean, you've, you um, felt 200 milligrams of Cadian was helpful. You could definitely feel a difference than just 30 milligrams of methadone alone. Yeah, and and that's the feedback that we get from patients mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Um. I mean, I I've been prescribing now for, ooh, ten years, <laughs> um, and I've been prescribing Cadian for about two or three, probably since I think Lisa Bromley or Suzanne Turner or somebody inspired me to start trying it for patients when fentanyl, when popcorn, most people, some of you might remember, pop, people were using popcorn. That was around the beginning of fentanyl showing up. Um, and uh, I was really impressed. It, it helped people that felt like they, they seemed to feel hopeless. So a couple questions. Um, I, I think to echo what Sean said, there are a number of people I've worked with who feel better on SROM than methadone and are either on combinations or moving just towards SROM. Um, a couple of people have asked about carries with SROM and how you would um, think about um, eligibility for carries any differently than you would with methadone. Um, especially in people who might be on both and um, some of the logistics around that. So I really am using SROM when people um, are not therapeutic yet with their methadone. When they get therapeutic with their methadone, they shouldn't need it anymore if the dose of methadone is high enough or if they are stable enough that their fentanyl use is stopped experience with people who are getting methadone and SROM and have stopped their fentanyl use. All those things, all those three things. I have, I seem to have like a cluster of patients who are consistently using fentanyl and I feel my job is really to help protect them from overdose by keeping them, you know, keeping the conversation going and making sure they always have Narcan and um, keeping their prescriptions available to them. But I'm not necessarily expecting that they're going to get carries, nor do they at this time. But they know that the opportunity is there. By that point, I would think you're, you're either offering to move them over to buprenorphine or they're only needing methadone. I, I just haven't got there yet. Okay, so I, I'm going to disagree, but I think maybe, you know, we will, just in light of the fact that, that the talk was supposed to focus on methadone and, and not strong sure, sure. challenged by that, yeah. um, say that this is an ongoing area of discussion. I think as we begin to look at how we make decisions about carries overall, which I think was part of what you were getting to in your talks, sure. right? That determining stability or safety um, is something that I think we're going to have to really think about um, in a, a much more um, thoughtful way rather than just relying on the guidelines which were problematic and now that um, we know, thanks Mike for letting us know they've been rescinded without mm -hmm. something else that's really replacing them. And so I think that we will have to be having a lot more conversations about um, the utility of of carries and how we make those decisions. And I, I hope that we're learning a lot from the experience with the COVID OAT guidelines. Um, Mel, I'm gonna ask you a question that came up, which was about um, starting doses of methadone with benzodiazepines. Again, going back to the 2011 guidelines, we were pretty scared of starting on anything, you know, even more than 20 milligrams and thinking about going up like five milligrams at a time. 
these guidelines seem to suggest kind of throwing all that out. So could you maybe speak to the person who comes in to start um, and is on a dose of, you know, clonazepam, one or two milligrams a day by prescription versus someone who's not on a prescription benzodiazepines, but whose urine shows um, benzodiazepines when they're screened and doesn't necessarily have a, a prescription history. Right. So there's no question that in animal studies and human studies, benzodiazepines tremendously increase the lethality of methadone, but it, a lot depends on how it's taken. Uh, so benzodiazepines with regular use, they actually do lose their sedating properties. If someone's taking a, a regular dose of benzodiazepines, uh, you know, every day, not a high, just a regular dose, um, it really isn't that sedating. Uh, it may work for anxiety, but it's not sedating. So uh, I, the danger with benzodiazepines is like the same danger as with alcohol. It's the binge use in combination with methadone that's highly dangerous. So I would say that, uh, a, again, uh, you know, if someone's taking a small dose of clonazepam, uh, it, it, the, the risk is enormous of slowing down that uh, methadone titration because we see patients who cycle in and out of treatment all the time. They're on an inadequate dose, a suboptimal dose. They continue to use. They drop out of treatment for a few days because they can't get it together to go to the pharmacy. So their dose is dropped again and they can't get to a right dose. And if we make things even worse because they're on a small dose of benzodiazepines, then we're continuing to expose them to fentanyl. So I would say that, uh, you know, warn patients, I guess, uh, you know, see them. But I really, uh, I've never, again, I've seen people who have been toxic on high doses of benzos, of methadone. I've just never seen someone on a small dose of benzos who got, you know, methadone toxic. But we are dealing with, the, the problem we have to keep in mind is that treatment retention rates are dropping in Ontario. Methadone continues to be highly effective for people who remain on it. But evidence suggests that our treatment retentions are dropping in Ontario, and it's partly because patients who are using fentanyl are more likely to go through that cycle of staying on it for a few days or a week or two and then dropping out and then going back on it. So we got to get rid of barriers. I would say if they're on a regular dose of clonazepam and they're otherwise healthy and they don't have COPD, et cetera, just titrate the methadone as, uh, as quickly as you can. I want to come back to, you talked about titrating, um, a question that, that Jacqueline posed and there are some other sort of nuances. So um, in patients who are using seven to 10 points of fentanyl a day, where um, you're trying to combine both methadone and 200 milligrams or so of Strom, but people are missing many doses leading to frequent restarts. Um, any suggestions, and, and I think maybe this speaks to some of the suggestions that you referred to previously about trying to um, kind of re reduce the need for a full restart and how to help people get to an adequate dose. So Mal or Lori, could you speak to that? Well, Lori, why don't you try? So what, so the, can, the question so was... Frequent, so frequent missed doses leading to restarts and people having trouble getting to an adequate dose. Even when you're starting, let's say, methadone of 30 and strom of 200. And I think you spoke to this a little bit, but I'm wondering if you could just... Um, yeah, I do, I do have a couple of... I'm thinking of this couple in particular who I actually uh, went to 300. I, 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 Sean can probably speak to this, but um, the 300, they it made a difference. So it got them both above 60, which they hadn't done in six months. So I thought that was a win. Um, the thing I was, somebody said something about seven to 10 points and what do you do or what do you do when people are, you know, continually relapsing. I, the goal doesn't have to be our goal. It can be their goal. So, I mean, I mean, it should be their goal. So a patient, their goal may not be to not use any fentanyl at all. It may just be to be safer, um, to get their feet back on the ground, to not spend as much money on fentanyl, to get from fentanyl dose to fentanyl dose without withdrawal. Um, there's lots of different reasons why people might take methadone. 
And I think we have to be careful not to project our, you know, values or goals on someone else just because we're the prescriber. So to be fair, when I talk about, well, I have patients who are on methadone and Cadian and they keep, are still using some fentanyl, some of those, most of those patients are pretty okay with where they are right now. Like they're definitely more stable than when they came into the program. And for them, that's a win right now. And when they can just find, you know, a bloody place to live, that's not going to be full of drug dealers and other things can happen if we can start pulling in those other services from the community and now this is getting out of the scope of the talk I realize but my point is that it, it's impossible for us to project with everything that all the privilege we have in our lives how someone else is going to get off of fentanyl like it's just not going to be about their methadone and their SRAM it's going to be about a lot of other things as well and we have to just give them we're just some of the tools in their toolbox and we need to try to help them access other tools so that is a huge answer covering many many things I'm going yeah, to sorry to, <laughs> no I, I mean I think it's so important and I think that's what we recognize and convey medication is really, really important, and it's just medication. Um, and back to the specifics of that question, I think that um, if we don't cancel doses at day three, we give people an extra day. If we don't reduce the doses to starting doses right away after day four, but reduce to 50%, and if we are prepared to consider um, increasing doses in people who are getting stuck um, when they've had, you know, the four out of five days, for example, if they've missed what we can say, as long as you've had today's dose, you can increase tomorrow, then I think that will help a lot. And as we spoke to, you know, perhaps leaving those kind of starting dose levels at the pharmacy so that people don't have to wait to see a provider, especially as we've heard in, um, in rural areas where, um, you know, access is really limited. I'm going to go back in the chat to a question that Dale posed, and I it's an it's another really difficult one. There is not an easy answer, but I would be remiss if I didn't um, didn't read it out loud in case anyone missed it and, and pose this. So um, the comment is regarding the protective effect of methadone, 60 to 80 milligrams. Some patients reduce or maintain their methadone below this threshold while concurrently receiving safer opioid supply of hydromorphone, potentially up to 160 milligrams from another prescriber, and continuing to use fentanyl. Is this harm reduction or harm increasing in the age of fentanyl? And there is a lot to unpack there. Um, in uh, toward the end of a complicated session. So um, which of you wants to try to yeah, that. I can take that on. I think the, the key difference, and it's a very profound difference between safer opiate supply and opiate agonist treatment, it's not so much that they use hydromorphone, is that they uh, allow take-home doses, uh, unsupervised doses right from the beginning of treatment, in large amounts. Uh, and furthermore, that they uh, allow or even encourage the injection of oral tablets. So uh, hydromorphone, if it were dispensed observed, could be uh, having the same benefits and limitations as methadone or cadian. But when you give it uh, to take home, uh, that means, uh, and, and does happen, that you're actually expanding the drug supply. And we know that. We know that it's happening in communities in London and Toronto and elsewhere, that hydromorphone oral tablets are flooding the market. And that actually increases harm. Maybe not to the patient himself or herself, but it, it does increase harm to the public. It exposes new patients to, uh, you know, uh, a potentially addicting drug. And it, it looks like a lot of people are using hydromorphone and fentanyl at the same time. Now, this particular patient is on, he or she is on 60 to 80 milligrams of methadone. Uh, so that person is somewhat protected against uh, overdose. Uh, I don't know why that person would be given hydromorphone, uh, 160 milligrams by another prescriber. I have no idea what the clinical rationale for that. If they are giving that dose as take home, what that means is that patient is, uh, could very well be 
uh, selling it probably is that's 800 milligrams morphine equivalent that's a very big dose probably selling it to use fentanyl him or herself uh, and could be injecting it causing a dramatic increase in bacterial infections and there is in fact evidence from a, a very good case control study in France, a very large study, that giving take-home doses of morphine oral tablets of morphine increase the rate of overdose and increase the rate of bacterial infections. Uh, so this safe opiate supply by is, you know, I think discarding decades of controlled trials, systematic reviews to give opiates in a, a completely unregulated way to give take home doses of opiates that are, uh, you know, being used in a way that increases the harm to the patient and increases the harm to the public. And so I, I really think that uh, that prescriber, I don't understand, it sounds like there's someone prescribing safe opiate supply and the person's on methadone. Like I guess they're getting methadone from another doctor. That makes no sense. Those doctors have to get their act together and provide a, a, a treatment that is actually safe for that patient, protecting them from overdose and protecting them from bacterial infection. Laura, go ahead. Um, I just, I think, just to add to what you said, absolutely. Um, the if people think that safe supply and can, in addition, or safe supply, I don't even. But hydromorphone tablets, in addition to methadone, are helpful to uh, patients. Then the people prescribing the hydromorphone tablets can definitely be the ones that prescribe the methadone. I don't like to see that happen necessarily because they may be less experienced. But I think it's very challenging when there's two different people and they're not communicating. I mean that's obvious right there. There's other issues as well. My opinion is give people money, give them a place to live. Like why tablets? You know when they can have money and and and. Uh, you know, we could again. We'll get into we 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 won't get into any of it. But I really feel like that that the tablets are just another currency that is a sign of how desperate people are to just try to achieve some sort of sense of safety in their lives. Yeah, I'm I'm reading Dale's comment. Prescribed hydromorphone is certainly being traded for fentanyl and mostly injected. There is a group in Toronto that is coordinating a collective across the province for hydromorphone prescribing. Yeah. Um, I think we know that right now the the main centers for um, hydromorphone prescribing are in Ontario, Toronto, London, and I think with a group in Ottawa. Um, I I I think that it really challenges us to think about, um, for me anyway, sort of what I'm prepared to consider in terms of my limits around harm reduction as a prescriber. But I think to your very, very important point, Lori, it's hugely problematic to have two different prescribers. And um, I would not feel good about that at all as a methadone prescriber. And I would offer to take on prescribing um, and suggest maybe something like SROM along with methadone, um, but not hydromorphone, mm -hmm. um, or encourage the hydromorphone prescriber to look at something that can help to move that person along the, that continuum towards safer use overall. Um, we've heard that the machines, the vending machines, Sean, you're saying in Vancouver, are coming to London, Ontario. Um, I think that was in an article that Katie Denham shared with us this week. And um, I think we're in for a really, really interesting, difficult ride. And um, um, not sure what else I can say about that. Um, I think I just want to highlight that there is has been an interesting conversation in the chat about methadose and meth methadol, methadol D. And I think that this is um, something that we should. Um, advocate more actively for in Ontario, because in my sort of end of two pharmacies, one said no, and the other said, absolutely, sure. So uh, for people who have had that experience of transitioning off it, um, and then I have the option of going back on, um, they seem to be really happier. And I think that that's something that we should look at. I'm just scanning to, um, 
make sure that I haven't missed any really big topics. I know that there are others about what to do around um, adjusting SROM and how high do we go. And I think that probably in the interest of time, I would say um, these are chats we can continue to put into the lister as questions. The document that we've, um, that Lori and Mel presented uh, really eloquently in terms of summaries tonight is not a full and comprehensive approach to prescribing methadone. It doesn't deal with all of the special cases. It doesn't deal with um, queries in depth, um, but it's a guide and it's a beginning to a further conversation. As Mel said, it will be posted on the website. We had hoped by tonight, but I'm gonna guess tomorrow, our knowledge broker, Sarah Clark has been hard at work getting the final uh, sort of formatting and references in. And attached to it will be a survey for um, questions that will be on call kits. As of now, um, it's not um, going to be posted on the CPS website. And I think another conversation to continue on the list serve um, might be what actually the um, the role of the college will be. Um, I think that it will be to step fully out of the role of guidelines and regulating. Um, and so there won't be I, as I understand it, any official endorsement of any guidelines by the college as they're not for any other medication. So there are multiple groups. There, there are prison groups. There's a, a national guideline group that CAMH is involved with. And um, um, I think that um, those groups are coming together with the Federation of Medical Regulatory Authorities across Canada speaking to guidelines that won't have the same sort of nitty gritty details that we're used to. So again, I think it's going to involve lots of education, lots of clinical judgment overall. Um, I want to say before we wrap up to please remember to complete your evaluations. I want to thank everyone for participating. Sean, I really especially want to thank you for making yourself available on the chat. I know you worked very hard to try to get online with us and um and thank you for making yourself available in the way that you could we look forward to really continuing um this conversation with you um, and to include you and some of your colleagues in our future conversations around this guideline and others lastly i want to take the opportunity to remind people that we did send out another um letter on the listserv to invite people who are interested in advocating for COVID vaccination in their clinics to respond to us by signing a letter. Um, one of the roles that Medify takes seriously is advocacy. And although it will be a big challenge, we want to continue to bring this request forward to the local public health units. We know that there are small pilots looking at shelters and looking at mobile clinics for folks who are homeless, but we think that there are a lot of very willing clinicians um, and if we can help bring them forward to their medical officers of health and public health units to get some vaccines where people really are seeing clinicians, we'd like to do that. Thank you, Mel and Lori. Thank you, Sean. Thank you to the Medify group for um, being here. And um, you all have an extra two and a half minutes. So thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Uh, bye. Don't know to log out.